Philippians chapter 1. We'll meet with Paul again this evening as he is still in jail. Um, He does not get out this letter, just so you know. So we'll be with him every week as he is uh, suffering for the kingdom. One thing that we need to be reminded as we are reminded often in Scripture is the fact that um, unless the Spirit works, then this is all for naught. We sang a song that, brethren, we have come to worship. One of the lines says, All is vain, all is vain, unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. And of course, he's mentioning the Spirit of God that comes down upon us. So all is vain unless the Spirit of God comes down. And that is absolutely true. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Go down to verse 12. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. We'll read through verse 18, um, but we'll focus on verses 15 through 18. It says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would help us, Father, as we work through your word to understand it rightly, um, to understand it rightly, to see what you have spoken of in your scripture, and that we would have ears that hear and eyes that see these truths and they would prod our hearts that these truths would prick us, Father, that we would not be able to stay where we are, but that we would be, we would be driven to, to live lives that are for the sake of Christ and for your kingdom. God, work these truths in us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So Philippians chapter 1 now, we've been through it in a few weeks, the last several weeks. And in verses 12 through 18, he mentions uh, being in prison for the sake of Christ and, and kind of the reactions of people around the area um, because of his imprisonment. Now, I want to ask a question that may be something that will help guide us as we work through this text. And the question is this, how much is the advancement of the gospel and the glory of Christ worth to you. So how much is the advancement of the gospel and the glory of Christ worth to you? To put it differently, how much are you willing to give up for the advancement of the gospel? How much are you willing to give up for the glory of Christ? So this text is about Paul's joy and his rejoicing in the proclamation of Christ in spite of his own circumstances. He starts with verse 12 saying, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And he finishes this paragraph, if you will, dropping down to verse 18, which he says, Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So, He says, this is gone for the greater progress of the gospel, my imprisonment, and in the way in which this message is being spread out, I rejoice in this. In in light of recent circumstances of his life, he is one who is rejoicing. So again, if we were to, to kind of try to follow Paul's train of thought here, could we say the same thing? Would we say that our circumstances, negative or positive, In Paul's case here, it's negative, right? Or it seems to be negative. Would we say that it's worth it? That it's worth it to be persecuted? That it's worth it to receive different circumstances in our life that will cause inconveniences, maybe heartache and trouble? 
Yet be able to say it's, it's worth doing for Christ's sake. Is it worth doing for advancing the gospel? And really, what in our lives, if we were to look around our lives, will we, will we look at our lives and, and, and you know, we take inventory, so to speak? Would we, able to look at, would we be able to look at certain things and say, is Christ worth giving up? Or is Christ worth us giving up these things over here? Should we, be, should, be, should we be willing to give up everything for the sake of Christ? Well, absolutely. Should we be willing, though, if we're worried about advancing the gospel, if we're worried about Christ's name being proclaimed and many people coming to Christ, what should we be willing to do? Um, I think in our culture, we are oftentimes willing to compromise for the sake of advancing the gospel. In our culture, we're willing to um, even water down the message for the sake of advancing the gospel. So let's ask it that same question, maybe in a different way. Should we, we, be, we be, that phrase is killing me. We be willing, that's hard. We be willing, should we be willing? Should we be willing to change the message? Should be, we be okay with that, changing the message? Could we just switch the message to match the audience? Could we switch the message to match the times that we're living in? Religions come and go, and oftentimes we see the culture kind of impact religion, of course. And so as the culture shifts in one direction or the other, religion is oftentimes doing the same thing, copycatting the culture shifting in one direction or the other. In fact, just since Christ has come and preached his message of following him as being the Messiah and and his inevitable death on the cross and his raising from the dead, and then all who repent and believe in Christ will be part of the family of God now, even after the gospel was first preached in the New Testament. In 2,000 years of church history, we've had different religions spring up. We've had different heresies come out. And many of these heresies are are not anything new necessarily. They're oftentimes old heresies being recycled. But as we follow these, and and this is is probably the easiest group for me to pick on, so I'm going to pick on them again. But you can follow this with the last 150 years or however long it's been with the history of the Mormon church. Every cultural shift, the Mormon church says, we'll shift with them. We'll shift right there with the culture. And so the culture of the Mormon church was we were really uh, pro-polygamy. We love polygamy. And then the United States outlawed polygamy as a practice. So the Mormon church just shifted their views and said, hey, listen, we have a revelation from God. We're going to now shift our views to be in line with the culture. And so that's what they did. They um, were not a big fan of different races of people, right? They were racist from the very beginning against different types of people and skin colors and stuff, right? And so what happened? Civil rights movement came around, and the Mormon church says, we've had an epiphany. We're going to shift our ideology and our theology to match the culture. And they've done that many times, and other religions have done the same thing. But are are we willing to do that? Are we willing to look at the gospel and say, we will shift that to match the culture? Even if it's heresy or not, we'll shift to match the culture. Of course, we would say no, right? And we should say no. We should say absolutely not. We will never shift the preaching of the gospel. We'll never shift the message of the gospel. Paul says, if anybody does that, by the way, you should consider them accursed. If you have your a finger in Philippians chapter 1, go back to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, Paul makes it very clear. In fact, I think this is something that is really important for us to understand in light of the constant shifting of our culture. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. It says, which is really not another gospel, not another, only that there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. He's saying they're not really preaching the gospel of Christ. They're preaching something else. He says in verse 8, But if even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary 
to what we have preached to you, what we have preached to you before, then he is to be accursed. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. So Paul is essentially calling this, this heresy so, something that this man who is preaching this false gospel, they are to be accursed. They are to be rejected, right? Because they are preaching a false gospel gospel. So we know that we shouldn't change the message and we know that we shouldn't be willing to change the message. But but what if the culture shifting a little bit and maybe it would be easier to water down the message? Should we be willing to water down the message to make it more palatable? Should we, we be willing to water it down, to, to not shift it necessarily, but to, to make it easier for us to consume, to make it easier for the public to consume, where people will want to accept the message maybe. Should we be willing then to, to change this? Well, no, I think we would all say no, absolutely not. We can't shift the message in any way, shape, or form from when God first delivered it to us. That should be easy for us. Now, sometimes this is more difficult because we, we kind of wrestle through these things. We don't know. Okay, well, that's the same message, but it's just a little bit watered down. It's, it's the same essence, right? So it's okay then. Well, Paul didn't think so. If you're still in that passage in Galatians chapter 1, we know how he feels about a different gospel. Let's go to a couple places where Paul is mentioning how men have, have I would say, watered it down. Maybe he, he uses different terminology there. But this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 with me. Now the root of this is maybe different than, than watering down the message. Absolutely. But he is criticizing in a way, a way in which we could use the gospel for profit or use the gospel for our benefit in some worldly way. And he says, we did not do that, by the way. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, down to verse 17. He says, we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. So let's say that again. He says, we are not like many, peddling the word of God. And so in this way, he, would, he is obviously criticizing that action. We don't peddle the word of God. We don't come to you and say, listen, we offer it only because it benefits us. Or we make it a little bit easier for you to understand because it benefits us. In fact, if there's anybody that we could learn from their testimony of how they have preached the gospel, it would be Paul, who never peddled the gospel. He didn't make it easier for anyone. He certainly didn't make it easier for the people who hated him the most, like the Jews. Right? He didn't make it easier for them. He pointed the finger right at them, just like Christ did, just like John the Baptist did. But he doesn't stop there. Just a few chapters over in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, listen to what he says in verse 2. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. He says, We have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He says again, We have We've renounced the, the hidden things because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God. Paul is very clear that he does not want to be associated with someone who would adulterate the word of God who, or who would peddle the word of God. If this is God's word, give it to the people. Give it to those who would listen because we need the fullness of God's word. We need to be told truth. We need to be rejoicing in the truth of the word. We're not rejoicing in lies being told. We're not rejoicing in falsehoods being preached or even watered down versions being preached. It would be like going to a, uh, a doctor and the doctor says, listen, um, I have a drug here. This drug will heal you, but I'm going to give you a, a, instead of giving you the fullness of the drug, I'm going to give you the smallest dose possible and then give you all this other supplement or maybe even more like a uh, placebo or something like that. We would know that, that would be some, there would be an issue there, right? Because that's not the fullness of what I need. 
And that's the gospel itself. We don't want to take pieces. We want to give what Paul said to the, in, in the book of Acts is the whole counsel of God. That's what we want. That's what we should want to hear ourselves. But that's also what we should want to be preached. We should want that to go among the nations, not mixed with lies and falsehoods, not a gospel that is watered down, but a gospel that is preached and preached in its fullest extent, which is with its fullest applications. So in light of the gospel being preached, if we're really worthy, or, we're, or rather Christ is really worthy of us giving up everything, he's not worthy of us giving up partly, right? He's worth giving everything up for Christ's sake, to give up all of our modern conveniences for Christ and willing to undergo, hopefully, we would be willing to undergo the persecution of Christ, right? I, I know that would be difficult for us to imagine now in our culture, but if we were to ask ourselves, I think we would all say that we would, we think we would be willing to undergo persecution for Christ. But Paul doesn't leave this section here as in, hey, listen, it's, it's okay that you know, we just are persecuted for Christ's sake. He says, actually, at the very end, he says, I'm rejoicing in these circumstances. So if there is a gospel that we are following, then we want the gospel to be preached in its entirety, in its fullness. If there's a gospel that is worth us being persecuted for, it would be the fullness of the gospel. And so sometimes we look at a passage like this out of Philippians chapter 1, and go back there with me, if you will, in Philippians chapter 1, and we, we are sometimes confused by the wording that Paul uses here. And I would admit that up until I think about a year ago, I was confused about this passage as well. He says again, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, verse 12, so that in my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now, we worked at that last week, and that I think that was easy for us to understand the implications of which Paul is trying to explain. Verse 15, though, I think can be difficult for some. He says, some, there are people out there that are preaching Christ. He says, some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So this section, verse 15, saying that some people preach Christ from envy and strife, for, verse 17, out of selfish ambition, rather than for pure motives, in order to cause him distress in his imprisonment, that coupled with the idea that seems to suggest in verse 18 that he's well he says this clearly that in every way whether in pretense or in truth christ is proclaimed and in this i rejoice okay so i think we have a few options here of what paul means by this because it can be somewhat um, troublesome to think through because on one hand we might think well what does paul mean that he's fine with people as as long as they're legitimately preaching the gospel is he fine with that, as, even if it's out of wicked motives, as long as it's a legitimate proclamation of the gospel? Is he saying that if they have wicked motives, that's okay, as long as the gospel is preached? That's one option. In other words, meaning that we could apply this to every orthodox preacher in the world. That as long as they're preaching the right things, we can rejoice over that, even if they have bad motives motives, even if it's a watered-down version of the gospel, not quite heresy, but a watered-down version of the gospel. As long as they're doing that, we're okay with that. That's, that's one option. That's one option of what Paul is saying. I, I don't think he's saying that. We read a few passages where Paul is very clearly not um, in line with anyone who would change the gospel or with anyone who would peddle the gospel anyone who would mix the gospel or or even, I think, water it down. 
I think this is the option of what Paul means here. I think in verse 12, I'm sorry, I rather maybe verse 15 where he says, Some to be sure are preaching Christ from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. I think, here's what Paul means, I, I think. Either he means what we said before, and that's one option, or he means the word, and when we look at the word preaching, right, that's kind of our hang-up, that some, to be sure, are preaching Christ. And we think, well, that means a proclamation of the gospel. But if you think about it, do we oftentimes use the word preaching in a different context than simply being behind a pul pulpit preaching the gospel clearly to others? Do we use it in a different way? Well, absolutely, right? If somebody says, hey, you're preaching to the choir, do we mean that they're literally preaching the message of Christ? No, we mean that just in a broad proclamation sense, right? That they're maybe they're preaching on somebody, they're getting after them really big, right? So that let the teacher in class today was really preaching. Well, that doesn't mean they were preaching Christ. It means we mean that they were proclaiming, maybe even very directly. Maybe we've told people to not preach to us. Don't preach to me that stuff, right? Um, in that way, we might think of this as more of a proclamation. In fact, the word in Scripture here is the word Caruso. You, you probably know that word before. You probably heard it before. There used to be a, a Christian T-shirt company. I don't know if they're still around, but they were they were named Caruso. Um, that word means in Greek to preach. It does mean to preach or to proclaim or to herald. And it's used differently at different times. In fact, um, probably 30 or 40 percent of the time in the New Testament, it's used and translated as proclaim rather than preach. Would you check the back door, please? Um, it's used as proclaim rather than preach. Again, our culture uses the word preach in a very broad way, and I think Paul has used that word, that Caruso word, in broad ways before. And I believe that Paul means that people are telling other people about the story. They are proclaiming other people or to other people about the story of Jesus and about the story of Paul being imprisoned on Christ's behalf. In other words, what Paul is saying, I think, here, he says that some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and strife. I think he's saying there are some out there that are taking this message about me being in jailed and in prison for the sake of Christ, and they're telling other people about this. I think he means simply that, that they are just spreading the news, that they are proclaiming this, this story here, maybe even linked with the gospel story in a way. Think about what he says in verse 15. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ. So that, that would make us think preaching the gospel about Christ. But if we just translated that as being proclaimed, some people are proclaiming Christ out of this way. Then we have that in the context of verse 13. What does he say in verse 13? He says, in my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, that imprisonment is well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. We well, didn't say people have gone out and preached about his imprisonment. It's that this word, of course, is spreading because people are talking about these things. I think if we were to use this, you know, kind of have an example, maybe a, a, an example of this, I think, you know, just imagine a, a lady going down to the supermarket. And there's a lot of stuff going on around town. They're in Rome, and they heard about this guy named Paul. And so Susie says to Sally, hey, have you heard about this guy named Paul, by the way? I don't know if you've read the newspaper or whatever, but but it's in it's in the newspaper. It's online. It's on all the social media sites, right? It's, it's everywhere. They're talking about this guy named Paul. And, and, and think about this from a Roman perspective, and I think this is what Paul's talking about, maybe because he says envy and strife, which those are negative things. So imagine Susie telling Sally, or I can't think of really clever Roman names off the top of my head, so I'm sorry. Susie and Sally's got to be it. Um, so Susie's telling Sally, have you heard about this guy named Paul, Paul of Tarsus, right? He used to be a Jew, and you know about all the Jews. They, they worship kind of a crazy God. He kinda, they only worship one God. Well, now this Paul of Tarsus guy, he's proclaiming that there is this one God and that his son is that Jesus guy. You remember in the news, like several years ago, there was a guy in Jerusalem causing all this strife and craziness going on in Jerusalem. They ended up killing him. You remember that story? And she would say, well, yeah, I remember. I read the newspaper. I remember that story, right? And they said, all these followers of this guy said that this guy was raised from the dead. What was his name again? Oh, it was Jesus. 
And he was supposed to be the promised Messiah. A lot of this little faction in Judaism, they would think that, right? This little faction thinks that this guy is their Messiah. Well, they killed him and they all say he raised from the dead. Now that's crazy. I know it is. That sounds absurd. That's what they would say. And this guy now, he used to be a Jew. He used to kill Christians. And now he's actually a Christian. And he goes out and preaches. Now he's found himself in a Roman jail. And so that's what they're doing. I can just imagine that being the conversation, people spreading information. We do that in our culture, in every other culture, in human history. Word has spread really fast, right, about things that seem like they're incredible events. And maybe this is one of those things because he says the word of what has happened has gone out in the old, the entire Praetorian Guard, which would have all been uh, Caesar's household. All the guards, he would have had hundreds of guards that would have been assigned to take care of him and protect him and his family. So that's, that's dozens and dozens and dozens of families hearing about Christ. I think that's what's going on here. I don't think they're actually, I don't think Susie is taking the gospel and going to the street corner and saying, listen, I'm, I'm really envious of Paul. I, I really have a lot of strife here and I'm going to start preaching a faithful message. Because I don't think, Paul Paul is very clear in other places, that he would be excited about a false gospel being preached. Does that make sense? You with me on that? I I think he would not be excited about a false gospel being preached. I think what he is suggesting is that people are talking about what's going on, maybe even mocking them. They might even be saying, this guy's a fool. What does he know about anything? I mean, he's, he's literally worshiping a singular God who came and died for people. Who? What God dies? And think about all these Roman pagans. They would say, first of all, these people don't even know anything because there's a bunch of gods, right? And none of these gods die. Why would he ever be self-sacrificing? It would be absurd to them. They would mock him. But he says that some of them are doing this in envy and strife. Could you imagine people telling a story out of envy and strife? Well, yeah, absolutely. Right? Even in our culture, people tell stories out of envy or strife. I, I liken this to a to a story maybe a few years ago in the middle of COVID. You remember John MacArthur's church, uh, Grace Community, I think, in right outside of Los Angeles. Or I don't know if it's in the city limits or not, but it's in Los Angeles County. And they didn't shut down for COVID. And, you know, you remember the story. Um, they had thousands of people that would come to church and want to worship. And they didn't shut down. So what happened? All the news stations started doing news on their church. And so the news stations were saying all these things about them and and mocking them and, and, you know, I guess trying to shame them or something. Um, Even other Christians, if you remember, there were other people who proclaimed to be Christians who were writing articles in Christian magazines or in public um, online, you know, online sites or whatever saying, hey, Look at this guy. He's not representative of us. He's doing his own thing, right? And they were almost mocking what that church in Southern California was doing. I think this is part of that in a, in a way, maybe in our context a little bit. Um, of course, we know we'll be mocked for the sake of Christ. We'll know that people will think we're absurd for the sake of Christ. We know that people will think we are fools for the sake of Christ. That's, that's part of it, by the way. You're not normal. So if you want to be normal, this is not the religion for you. There's not a place to fit in. We're aliens in this world, right? Paul knew that. He went from town to town to town knowing that it's not going to go well for me. So if you want to fit in in the culture, that's, this is not the way to do it. Accepting Christ, running to Christ, being part of the family of God is not the way. Now you, of course, if you're part of the family of God, you are serving the creator of the universe. But he goes on to say again that some are, are preaching Christ, which I think is just, again, proclaiming Christ even from envy and strife. Now, just imagine the news and the culture and the, even the, the, the culture of news in our, in our nation. Could you imagine people mocking someone out of envy, wishing that they had that much to be said about them? I think that happened a lot in cases like one I just mentioned about the church, uh, Grace Community. Uh, I think many people were mocking them out of a jealousy. 
Because you can imagine that, right? You wish people would think about you and what you have going on, and so you mock others out of that. We do that a lot of times in our culture now, that we would make fun of somebody. We hear this in gossip or something like that. We're, we're criticizing somebody because they're receiving attention. That happens a lot. Anybody that receives attention, by the way, is going to be mocked by somebody because that's the culture. There's always going to be somebody who says, that's a dumb idea or that's foolish or whatever. And that certainly would be the case for somebody who is yielding to Christ and following after him. Now, could you imagine someone criticizing someone out of strife? Well, yeah, but they hate that idea. They hate that message. And so just imagine to go back to our scenario in around Rome, uh, while Paul is being imprisoned, people say, listen, this guy's a fool. They want everybody to know that this guy's a fool. And maybe it will cause him strife. Maybe it will cause him um, harm in some way. Maybe the uh, culture is such that um, the emperor would hear about it, the, 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 the ruler of the Roman Empire would hear about it, and maybe, maybe some rulers over Paul would hear about it and make his life more difficult if they, if they were saying these negative things about him. He goes on to say that some do it out of selfish ambition in verse 17. He says they do it out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Like I just mentioned, I have no doubt that that could be certainly something that would happen. Like if Joe worked the night shift at Paul's prison, wouldn't you imagine if somebody really hated Paul? Maybe he was a Jew in the area. So Joe, listen, that guy's a jerk. He's the worst. Make his life miserable. I, I could imagine these things. Now, some are preaching, of course, and proclaiming this message out of goodwill. And I think for us, we should never miss an opportunity to point others to Christ. So some people were hearing about Paul's imprisonment. Everybody else was hearing about Paul's imprisonment. So they're telling, hey, their neighbor says, hey, I heard about this guy named Paul that's thrown into jail. And he said, actually, yeah. Do you know why? They said, well, I heard it's because he is the worst. He has the worst religion. They only worship one God. And what do you have? Well, you have an opportunity to minister the gospel to that person. And so there are some, he says, that are proclaiming Christ out of goodwill. Maybe an opportunity to share about the message of Jesus. Maybe an opportunity to share about what Paul actually believes. We can certainly do this in tragedy. We can certainly do this in culture wars. I think we live in a nation where there are so many segues into the gospel, it's almost impossible not to stumble over one, right? Right? We're constantly thinking about, well, how do I start a conversation with somebody? This is America 2023. I mean, my gosh, there are a billion things happening right now that are really insane if you're paying attention. So easily we could segue that into the gospel, right? We could talk about politics, the culture at large. We could talk about all sorts of things that are happening in, in our world. And they seem like they're, they're happening daily. So it shouldn't be difficult for a Christian who is caring for neighbor and has a love for neighbor to minister the gospel to them while the world's on fire. Because you can just say, look, there's a fire. You know why there's a fire? I said, well, yeah, it's because of these things. Well, actually, you can tell them there's a deeper root to that. And the deeper root is sin. And, and it, it has trapped you. It, it owns you. And the only one that can rescue us from the sin is, of course, Christ Jesus. So we use opportunities like this to minister the gospel. Paul says, Paul says that they do it out of goodwill, verse 16. They do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. So they know that talking about these things, it doesn't hurt me. Even if somebody hears that there are more Christians in the area than they can even imagine, because all these Christians have started talking about Paul being somebody who they link to. He says, I'm not worried about these things. It's like if they do it, they know that I'm appointed for the persecution and the defense of the gospel. They know these things. So it's fine with me. Jesus actually did this a lot in his ministry. He would use things going on around the world and point people back to Christ. Think about Luke chapter 13. Uh, the Luke chapter 13, there's this picture of this guy kind of coming up and sharing with them information, this news about people who have been killed by Herod. And then he goes on in verse 4, Jesus is telling the people, well, there was a tower that fell in Siloam and killed all these people. And Jesus says, you really shouldn't fear those things, all these earthly things. But what? He said, he takes this information that's happened, this news event, and the same, instead of saying, yeah, you're right, let's, I'm really worried about that. Um, he's not callous towards loss. But he doesn't just buy into it or, or, or fall into just being empathetic. 
He also points people to Christ out of that. He says, although that happened and people have lost their lives, listen, I'm telling you, do not fear man who can kill body. Do not fear the things that can kill your body, but fear God. He says, you should all likewise perish, he says in verse 5 of Luke chapter 13. So there are things that happen to our, us in our lives. We mentioned this last week going through the first several verses of this paragraph. There are things that happen in our lives that can point people to Christ. Um, there's a famous missionary who's named Amy Carmichael, and she went and, and gave up much of her life ministering the gospel in India. And in her life... Um, Part of her ministry there, she was always constantly busy, 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 busy working. And then at one point in her life, she became bedridden and had to spend years and years and years in her bed. Um, And I'm sure it was something that absolutely frustrated her. But the Lord really used that because then she had to spend time on writing and writing letters and things like that. And the Lord, of course, used that uh, portion of her life, maybe even more so than the earlier portion of her life where she was able to walk around and, and do the things that she wanted to do. So sometimes opportunities God gives us for the sake of Christ, even if they're not convenient, even if they are persecution. And these people, of course, they know all circumstances. They come from God. So that's why it says in verse 16 that they know that Paul is appointed for the defense of the gospel. They know that all circumstances are providential, right? We read that earlier um, about God's providence, one of our catechism questions about God's providence, and that all of our lives, all the world is held in God's hand. Well, if that's true, then we can trust that all the circumstances, even if we don't like them, are in God's hand, and we can use those opportunities to point people to Him. Now, verse 17 he says, knowing, again, he says, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel, verse 17, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. They're proclaiming Christ in a way that may also benefit them. In this situation, do you think, do you think maybe there are people out there that try to profit from, from Christians in general? Well, Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, in, uh, in the book of Acts, um, chapter 17, there was a man named Jason who they knew about being a guy who had you know, housed Christians. So they, they got him and they kind of roughed him up a little bit and waited till they wanted money from him. And it says in, that, in verse 9 that they essentially had to pay him off. It didn't say that in the Bible. It, it, says, uh, it uses a different word there. But the idea is there that, um, well, I'll, I'll turn it before I mess it up anymore. 17 verse 9 he says and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others they released him the pledge is like a pledge of finances so we're going to give you money and you won't really bother us anymore well that would have been incredibly applicable not just in our times which it would be but also in their times there's a financial incentive for these people to know and maybe even tell other people about this instance so if you're you know a soldier or a guy who lives across from the county jail and Paul's in there and you know about him being a Christian, you, maybe you've heard the stories, maybe you know about churches in the area. Would it would be shocking to you that even 2,000 years ago, there's a guy thinking, I might get profit from this. I might go to these churches and say, listen, I'll help you get Paul out of here for a couple hundred bucks or whatever, right? A couple shillings, maybe I can help your buddy Paul out. Well, of course, Financial incentives, money, it's always a motivation, right? But Paul doesn't do this. Paul could obviously be used for political or financial motives. And I think this is what he's referring to maybe here. They're doing so out of selfish ambition. Maybe they say things maybe that would benefit them with other so-called Christians, right? I mean, in the culture that we live in, think about just the Christian retail world. Do you know how much money the Christian retail world makes every year it's in the billions it's in the billions it's not in the millions it's in the billions i, I want to say it was several years ago i think it was like 10 billion dollars a year or something like just a christian retail world 
So that's like selling Bibles, and we're, we're pro-Bibles, right? We want Bibles to be sold. That's the Christian t-shirts, that's Christian music, that's Christian bookstores selling Christian books, that's selling all the trinkets that every Christian place sells, right? Um, so that's the testimony of our world that we live in now. People trying to make a dollar, if they can, from any religious group around, right? But the gospel is the same now as it was then, and sin is the same now as it was then. And there's certainly, we can imagine, people around looking at Paul and saying, I, I know I can make money off this somehow. I can make money off of this somehow. Okay, And I, I think that's what happens. But Paul, on the other hand, listen to what he says in verse... Listen to what he says in verse... Uh, well, verse 17, he says, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition. I want to just make a mention here. Do you think... Paul does that, that he proclaims Christ out of selfish ambition. Or he, think about even in our culture, some people, of course, in our culture, if you're a business owner, would you tell people that you're not a Christian? Would you in our culture, in, in the South? Like if you had, I mean, think about it, um, and I don't know how common this is around here, but I remember being in like Northwest Arkansas where, you know, there's a million businesses and so they're constantly fighting for who can, you know, get get people's business, that the, that Jesus fish sticker would be on like so many businesses' signs. And I have no doubt in my mind that there would be some people who would slap that on their, you know, on their logo and say, hey, Joe's plumbing. Boom, we're Christians. Because there's always going to be some lady, maybe man or whatever. I would be guilty of that. I might be tempted to do that. Look into the phone book and say, hey, Jesus fish. I don't know what that means, but maybe that means they're a Christian. Maybe that means they'll save me a couple bucks. Maybe not. Maybe that means they charge me a couple bucks more. I don't know. But they're using that, right? There's not a proclamation of Christ happening there. There's not a testimony of actual preaching the gospel, right? They're not promising you that the plumber comes to your house and while he's working on your sink actually shares the gospel with you. There's no promise of that. It's simply they're making a connection. I think that's what's happening here. Paul never does that, by the way. He never uses it for his own selfish ambition. In fact, he tells many of the people in the churches, he says, listen, I never even needed anybody else's support because I supported myself. And he doesn't even go, stay there. He doesn't say, well, I, because I'm smart enough and good enough at my job that I can support myself. He says, the Lord, we'll get this at the, at the end of Philippians. He says, the Lord is constantly providing for me. He's constantly providing for my needs. I don't need your money. Paul is doing the exact opposite of a modern day you know, Christian salesman. He's not doing a good job of being a prosperity preacher, is he? He's not. He never does that. Oftentimes in our culture, not just in our culture, but certainly our Christian culture, if anyone has ever had a bad experience at all, the first thing they do is go look for ways that they could profit off of it. They look for ways in which they can make money. That might be publishing a book. That might be filing a lawsuit. It's some way to make money off of their bad thing. I mean, think about it. TV shows kind of mock that, that people like try to get in wrecks where they can sue somebody and make money off of it, right? So if we could imagine that happening in our, our culture, we could certainly imagine it happening in theirs. Paul doesn't do that. His concern is Christ. Even if people are mocking him, even if people think he's a fool, his concern is the proclamation of Christ. And so he's rejoicing. Even if people hate him more, even if more people are on board with hating his message and the mob against him grows, he's concerned with Christ. And that's why I think he says in verse 18, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So again, I think Paul is saying, if they're going to tell this story, if they're going to tell, maybe even they're mocking me, maybe even they're telling people, hey, listen, this guy's a fool. He worships a risen Savior. That's so absurd. I think Paul is saying, if they want to do that, that's fine. I'm just glad that Christ is being proclaimed. Not that he's being preached in the fullness of the gospel, but that the words about Jesus are being known. That people are, are hearing about the testimony of something about me, about Jesus, and maybe that will lead to people asking questions. Maybe that will lead to people actually asking the right questions about the gospel. Well, if Paul's in here, what's, what's the reason why a guy would, would worship in a religion that would hurt him? And they would ask questions about that. I think that's what Paul is, is suggesting here. 
is that if they're talking about the gospel, at least they're talking about gospel things, they're talking about Christian things, then in this I rejoice. And I love this. I love the fact that Paul connects everything back to Christ. I mean, look at his life. And he's constantly saying, I think, who cares about circumstances? I think he's constantly living this truth out. Who cares about suffering? Who cares about persecutions? If, if I suffer, but other people may know Christ more, I'm fine with that. If I'm suffering and other people might hear about the gospel, then I'm fine with that. I'll rejoice in that. So the question I asked at the beginning, what are we willing to give up for Christ's sake? Are we willing to give up conveniences? Are we willing to give up persecution even? Hard times. Are we willing to receive these things for the sake of people coming to Christ? Because Paul was. That's all he cared about. In any way, if, if Christ is being proclaimed, if people are talking about Jesus, they're talking about the message of the gospel, then I rejoice in this. How can we live our lives in this way? How can, because that's, that's the crux of this passage. That's the crux of what's, what's happening here. Is Paul is saying, I'm, I'm rejoicing in Christ in light of all these things. So how can we do this? How can we live in such a way that we rejoice when circumstances seem to go in a direction that is harmful to us or that seems like it is definitely not for our good? Well, a couple things. First, first, I think we can know truth, right? That if we are in Christ, if we are genuinely born again in the family of God, that, then nothing separates from us. Nothing separates us from the love of God. But also that God does cause all things to, for good for those who love Him. So it causes all things to work for good for those who love Him. So we believe that truth. That's part of it. I think the other thing is that our eyes are so fixed upon Christ that everything else doesn't matter. I think that's really where Paul's at over and over in his life. All these things that keep happening to him, all the frustrations. And it's not just, by the way, Paul's not just dealing with people who hate him. He's also dealing with all the church nonsense, constantly having to go write letters, constantly having to go minister to churches who don't understand the complete of uh, the fullness of the gospel, don't understand how to apply the gospel. Many people coming in like ravenous wolves trying to tear apart the church. Like it's not just an outside suffering for Paul, right? It's spiritual warfare daily. And, and Paul's, you know, one of only a handful of disciples, apostles. So if you think Satan's who is finite and only one guy, if you think he's only bouncing around now, attacking you and your life, and he's leaving the other million Christians alone, just imagine this in this time frame where there's not that many Christians. And so you know that there are demonic activities working around Paul, but his eyes were constantly fixed upon Christ. We see the truth of who we are in Christ, and our eyes must stay constantly on Christ. How do we know that Paul's eyes were constantly fixed on Christ. Well, he says later in this own this very chapter that we're in, go down to the end of verse 20. He says, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by, de by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He goes on to say in chapter 3, in verse 7, he says, for whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Paul's concern is constantly focused on Christ. His desire is Christ. His his. Gaze is constantly fixed upon Christ. If we struggle through circumstances to rejoice, we're struggling because our eyes aren't fixed upon Christ. That's where we must put our eyes at. That's what we must do. Realize who we are in Christ and constantly fix our eyes upon Him. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for your kindnesses. Thank you for your mercies. God, as we walk through passages like this, some of which are difficult to understand, and God, help us understand, if anything, the continual care that Paul had for Christ and the way in which you work in men by your Spirit to give us a desire of Christ. And Lord, I ask that you would, you would help us be a people who we could spend all of our time focused on our circumstances. We could spend all our time focused on what's going on around us, what other people say, or even what's going on around the world. But we're not called to do that. That wastes time. Our calling is to keep our eyes focused upon Christ. So, Lord, I ask that you would help us do that. God, please, there's a million distractions out here. And each one of us have vices that just pull us in the direction of those distractions. But Lord, let our eyes be so fixated upon Christ that everything else in the world is dull, that everything else in the world just fades. Help us be a a people who are concerned with your honor and your glory above all, seeing you for who you are, God. So I ask that you would help us in these things. I ask that you would, by your Spirit's power, fix our eyes upon Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.